Today is a new day. Doesn't matter what you've done, the Lord can forgive you. God wants to change our hearts before He changes our circumstances. I believe that God is going to bring peace in a broken world through you. Good morning, dear friends. Welcome to the Our Power and thanks for your support to us. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 to 10, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdoms and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Today, the message of Pastor Bob Schiller is to grow and improve in God. Pastor Bob Schiller teaches us to achieve God's calling in our life is by working hard on our spiritual life and storing up heavenly treasures where moth and vermin do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdoms and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. In order to grow and improve, we need love and faithfulness, God's wisdom and faith in God. Let's work hard daily to read the Bible so that we can grow spiritually. Our improvement in life can bless the life of other people. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdoms and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Our program is bilingual broadcast. Other than our original English, if your TV is equipped with NACAM facility, you can choose to watch our power in original English or Cantonese dubbing. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, church family. It feels so good to be together. Amen. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name that every day you'd make us a little bit more like you, Lord. Help us to love more. Help us to pour it on more. Help us to give more. But Lord, most of all, help us to do it from a place of abundance. And that comes from your Holy Spirit. And we ask for it today in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I.
Preparation for the message, Matthew 14, 22 through 27. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. The word of the Lord. Of the sweetest of 
Ali Patterson is a writer, speaker, and pastor who, after many years of working in corporate America, earned a degree from Dallas Theological Seminary. She now serves as a teaching pastor at Crossroads Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Her first book, How to Stay Standing, Three Essential Practices for Building a Faith that Lasts, looks at how we can hold on to our faith when life hits us hardest. Please welcome Allie Patterson. Allie, hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. I, I always appreciate it when pastors can join us on Sunday morning. It's, you got a lot going on, I'm sure. So we're grateful to have this time with you. Um, for those who have not met you before, let's begin a little bit with your story and your faith journey. Sure, absolutely. Um, great to be with everyone today. I actually first came into truly a relationship with Christ in the way that I understood it at the time when I was 16 years old. And when I look back on that, I just really, I thank the Lord for that sort of early anchoring. And that was very authentic connection with Jesus at that time in my life. But like a lot of us, college caused me to wander off a little bit. And um, I truly began to build my life and my world and my future on things that were not God and were certainly not his ways. I, I think I did what a lot of us are told to do. You know, I was a good kid. I got good grades. I planned a good life. I found a good guy. And I started to build my life in the way that the world really says should work. And it should have worked. And it didn't. Yeah. Um, and so as I, as I really um, came into my 20s, what I realized is God was pushing back into my life again. And I recognized it, I felt his presence, and I didn't know how to come back to him, but I knew there were some cracks in the way that I had been building my life. It's interesting today where I'm actually talking about the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of the cross. It's hard to explain sometimes, but I feel like you're defining it perfectly because there is wisdom in the world. There is stuff out there that's useful for us, but the wisdom of the cross is, it needs to be at the heart of it all kind of a thing. Well, was there a turning point for you? Because it's not every day you hear somebody going from the corporate world to becoming a mm -hmm. pastor. Um, was there a time when it all sort of just turned for you? Like, how did that process happen for you? Yes, absolutely. So I was, I was doing it, right? I was doing life the way that I thought it was supposed to work. And I was newly married, traveling, really traveling the world, earning probably far too much money for a person my age to really have wisdom to know how to deal with. And um, I really got myself entangled in relationships inside of my job that were really unhealthy for me, that were just leading me the wrong direction further and further away from God. And I ended up getting involved in an affair with a man that I worked with. And this is, this is the means by which God just came storming back into my life because I knew, I knew that this was not what he wanted for me. And you can feel that when, mm -hmm. when you are living in that kind of darkness, you can feel that, especially when you're already his, even if you don't know, you know, even if you don't know how to live it, when God puts his hand on you, you can feel the difference between that light and darkness, that worldly way versus his life for you. And I knew I was far away from what he wanted. And the turning point for me came one day, I'm a runner, I love to run, and um, came for me one day when I was out on a run and I started to cry and I just fell down on my knees and I, I spoke out loud to him and I said, Jesus, I can't get out of this. I don't know how, but I think you can. So I want you to get me out. And that began a very painful way out. But um, I began to truly follow him again during that super dark time in my life. Yeah. Wow, that's a powerful story. Mm -hmm. That must have been really tough to sort of bring that to, I mean, the greatest way, of course, to overcome shame is to bring whatever it is into the light, right? To just into be honest light. about who you are and just kind of reveal your cards. That must have been a, a very difficult, messy, long process. It was excruciating. I mean, it was, it began with his, really his push to me to openly confess what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I felt I was risking everything that I wanted 
my marriage, my job, my relationships, I knew that doing that was, was in the world's eyes, risking everything. But the truth of what happened is that as soon as I began walking in the direction of Jesus and what he was, would have me do, that's when he got involved. And yeah. believe me, you want him involved. Yeah. And so as soon as I began to say, okay, Lord, I'm willing to do this only because this is what your word says, I began to see him work in my life in, in crazy, amazing ways. And that also didn't stop the pain. So yes, I had to just gut out some real obedience to come out of that darkness. But in every single step of the way, he was palpably present. I mean, this, this was an incredible time where this amazing presence of God existed right alongside this terrible pain in my life. But I felt in alignment with his spirit for probably the first time. I feel like I could talk to you all day about this, but I really want to get to your book. And this story is actually in your book, isn't it? I mean, this is a part of what you write about, I'm sure. Um, but I want to hear, you have this book, people love it. It's the three essential practices for building a faith that lasts. The book is called How to Stay Standing. What are those three essential practices? Yeah, the three practices really come straight from the words of Jesus. And um, I always say this to people, I'm like I want you to want more of him because he is the one that he is the foundation. He is the rock under anything in your life that is going to stay standing. And so I take these three words of his from something he said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, for everyone who comes to me and hears my word and puts it into practice, I will show you what he is like. And then he tells a story about a man who built a house on a foundation of rock that stayed standing. And that's where I got the title for the book, How to Stay Standing. And there it is, right in, in full color. He says, everyone who comes to me, that's the first practice, hears my word, is the second practice, and puts it into practice, actually does what I say. Hmm. And believe me, those seem simple, but when it comes right down to it, they mean everything. So we dive into what did he mean by come to me? What does he mean, hear my word? What would it look like in my real everyday life to put that word into practice? And so those are the three parts of the book and um, they come straight from, straight from the word of God. Goodness, what, could there be anything better, right? Amen, yeah, the book is called How to Stay Standing by Allie Patterson. Allie, thank you so much for spending time with us. We appreciate you. Oh my gosh, so great to be with you all. I, I pray for and love what I see the Lord doing through your ministry and I will keep doing that. Thank you, Allie, appreciate you, God bless. Thank you, same to you.
matter who you are, would you stand with us? Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. We're going to say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with my neighbor. Thanks, you can be seated. Before I begin my sermon today, I want to encourage you that you can have a fresh start, that you can have a new beginning. And I want to encourage you today to get a fresh start by trusting and relying on Christ crucified. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us that we could be forgiven, that we could be at peace with God, that we could be empowered with the Holy Spirit, that we could be set free from sickness, that we could be set free from death itself, that heaven could become our home, that the church could become our family and our community, that every kid born without a father or without a mother could now have a father in the Lord, a brother in Christ, a sister in the church. My friend, this is the greatest opportunity that's ever been given to anyone. And so often we just let it pass us, let it go by us. I want to ask you today, Christ is near. He's near. He's coming. Either in your death or in his second coming, he's coming. We have to be ready. Make a decision today to follow Christ and be at peace with him. I want to encourage you today to choose to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, to invite him into your heart, to ask him for the forgiveness of sins, and your life will be changed. Today I want to say something that doesn't get said a lot in churches, but is absolutely biblical. I've made the claim many times. It's fundamental, in fact, to a good Christian life, and that's this. Investing in yourself is a gift to others. Not only is investing in yourself a gift to others, it's a moral obligation for Christians. It's something we're called to do. It's something we see in Sabbath. It's something we see in discipleship. It's something we see in Christian education. It's important to invest in yourself and not only to do it, but to see it as one of the most charitable, friendly, nice things that you can do for the people that live life with you. There's a time you would have said, Bobby Shuler was a hard worker. I hope you still say that. Bobby Shuler was a hard worker. I've worked in service. I've been a table expediter at a Mexican restaurant. I've worked at a ranch. That's hard work. I've worked on boats. I've worked in real estate. That's not that hard. I've worked in granite fabrication. But can I tell you, uh, in all those times, it took me so long, even as an adult, to understand the importance of working on myself. I'd work hard at the task. I'd work hard for a boss. I'd work hard for a paycheck. I'd work hard for a promotion, but I wouldn't work hard to reach the next level of who I was called to be. I wouldn't work hard on reading the scripture. I wouldn't work hard on prayer. I wouldn't work hard on mentors. And it became important to me realizing that the best thing I could do for my job was to work harder on myself than on my job. The best thing I could do for my kids was to work harder on myself than to work hard on my kids. And the list goes on and on. So. I understood this principle later on when I started getting tired because I was eating cheese for dinner every night. That's a true story. <laughs> there was about a year where I was going to Mother's Market and buying cheeses, and that was my dinner every night. I was eating cheese for dinner. And I just started feeling bad. Imagine that. And I heard this great principle. You've probably heard it before. Take care of your body and your body. Boy, is that true. Take care of your body and your body will take care of you. How about this one? Take care of your mind and your mind will take care of you. Here's another one, take care of your spirit and your spirit will take care of you. Let us not forget that these are not only things that seem obvious if we just look at them, but that they're actually made clear in scripture. You gotta work hard on yourself. You gotta work harder on yourself than anything else you work on. You gotta invest in yourself. My guess is you work hard, you work hard on everything but yourself. You work hard on your kids. You work hard on being a good spouse. You work hard on your ministry. You work hard on your job. But very often it feels like all of those things are going through the motions now. When you wake up in the morning, you're not excited about doing those things. Why? Because you've been working harder on those things than you have been on yourself. You've been investing in others more than investing in yourself. And on the surface, that sounds godly. Invest in others more than you do in yourself. But no, my friend, this is where it starts from. It starts, all of these things, they start from a place of abundance. 
When you're overflowing, when you're overflowing, when your cup overflows, then sharing becomes an easy thing to do. Yeah, that's right. Let me look at it this way if you're still not convinced. My guess is most of you have people in your life that you would say, I wish they worked harder on themselves than they worked on me. Anybody have a, somebody like that? A spouse, a friend, a parent, a child? Many of you have people in your life that you love and you would say the greatest gift they could give me would to become healthier. I wish my dad would take care of his body. I want him to make it to our kid's wedding. Or I wish so-and-so was more faith-filled or more positive. I wish so-and-so, if they just relaxed a little more and took a little time for themselves, took a vacation, maybe they'd be happier. We can think of these examples of people that we really love and we know if they invested in themselves, if they took care of themselves, if they took the time to build themselves up, it would be a blessing to everyone around them. Do you know people like that? I know I do, sometimes I'm that person. So here I'll say it again, don't forget, investing in yourself is a gift to others. I remember the Lord put on my heart early in ministry and I'm glad he did. I saw this picture of a fountain at, the, at this old ranch I was talking about I used to work at. Just this bubbling of water from the inside just goes a circle to a bigger circle to a bigger circle. If you're overflowing in spirit, if you're overflowing in word, if you're overflowing in positivity and fresh vision and compassion and kindness and love and openness, it's going to be a blessing to everyone around you. They're going to be filled up and it's going to be a blessing to them. They're just spills and spills and spills. This is a great to serve from a place of abundance. You say, doesn't the scripture say become a servant of all? Absolutely. But never forget that service is a skill. You ever been served by somebody that was bad at service? Doesn't feel like service at all. You sort of wish they'd go away. Many of us are doing that and we don't even realize it. Many of us are casting our pearls before swine. Many of us are smothering our children or our employees or our co-workers. Many of us are, because we're not serving from a place of abundance, but from a place of thirst, a place of hunger, a place of desperation, a place of willpower, we don't recognize that we're really not helping very often as much as we hope we are. And that makes us feel even more worthless and more empty and want to give up even more. My friend, invest in yourself. Invest in yourself. Invest in yourself. It's a gift to others. It's a gift to me. It's a gift to the world. It's a gift to our country. It's a gift to our schools. It's a gift to our places of work. When you invest in you, when you work harder on you than anything else you work on. And that brings me to my, the proof. The proof is in the pudding, and the pudding is the Word of God. Uh, I spent a lot of time studying the Sermon on the Mount. I still do. I've memorized it. It's three chapters in the Bible. It's considered the core teaching of Jesus. And I think the second most teaching Here's the first most important teaching. It's the Lord's Prayer. We gotta understand that. But here's the second one. And I think it sum summarizes almost everything that Jesus teaches. And I only realized it much later in life. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in the heavens where moth, is, moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Why is that so important? You know, the Bible talks about money and treasure more than any other subject. Did you know that? Because money shows us where our value is. Where you spend your money shows what you care about, what you invest in, what you really care about. And so he says that the best investment you can make is in heaven. As a kid growing up in Sunday school, I thought this meant an eternal reward when I die. Some kind of pile of treasure or a crown. Maybe it, maybe it was some kind of a, like a trophy. And that might be true. I think there is something like that. But we limit it to just our death. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, first of all, here's what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say you reap what you sow. Did you know that? Jesus never says you reap what you sow. He says, here's what you reap when you sow. 30, 60, 100 fold. He says, you invest a dollar, you get 30, 60, 100 dollars in heavenly, heavenly terms. Still, if that's just when we die, it's not that appealing to most of us, I think. But here's the second thing he says. You'll get 30, 60, 100 percent in this age. Everybody say, in this age. In this age. So everybody say, at hand. hand. What's at hand mean? Right now. Right now. So when it goes there, when you invest there in the kingdom of the heavens, when you invest, now when he says kingdom of the heavens, it doesn't mean just heaven. It means the air around you. It means in the spiritual world, which is all around us. It's in, it's in this room right now. It's wherever you are. 
It's wherever the Holy Spirit is, wherever God is. When you invest there, it's like, it's right here, it's at hand, it's in the actual air around us. But guess what, friends? Those treasures cannot be stolen. They cannot be taxed. They cannot be inflated away. They can never, ever lose value. The only thing that can happen is you can toss them away. That's the only, only way you can get rid of them. And it does happen. You can take it and throw it away. Some people do that. Here's some examples of what heavenly treasures were. We understand heavenly treasures to be knowledge, things like skills, things like goodwill, things like peace, things like leadership ability, things like confidence, et cetera, et cetera. These are things that we store up in the air around us that the more we develop them, they come back to benefit us 30, 60, or 100 times whatever effort we put into it. And they all benefit one another. They all benefit one another. This is why investing in yourself is so important. This is why working on yourself is so important. Let's do a case study real quick of how this worked in a Bible character's life. Many of us, we know the good part of Solomon. Those of us who have not read the Bible through forget that there's a bad part of Solomon. Solomon's an interesting character. Uh, he begins as a young man, chosen by David himself, very much like King David, the great king. God appears to him and says, Solomon, you're about to lead these people. You're a young man. You've got a lot of challenges ahead of you. Ask me for anything and I'll give it to him. What does Solomon ask for? He asks for a great heavenly treasure, one of the greatest. He asks for wisdom. And God says, you didn't ask for this. You didn't ask for money. You didn't ask for the defeat of your enemies. You didn't ask for this, 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 and this. You asked for wisdom. And I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to make you the wisest person in the world. But guess what? I'm also going to give you money. I'm going to give you the defeat of your enemy. I'm going to give you victory. I'm going to give you et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great promise. And it happens. We see that Solomon becomes incredibly wealthy, incredibly powerful, incredibly healthy. He becomes an achiever. He builds the greatest, one of the greatest temples in human history, the temple that David wanted to build and couldn't. People come from all around the world. We see great kings, great leaders, the, our, our, you know, the version of like dukes and duchesses and senators, those, these types of characters coming from all around the world to get great wisdom from Solomon. And everything he says to them helps them and benefits them in many ways. So not only does he grow in this heavenly treasure, but he shares this heavenly treasure with others and it benefits them greatly. That's phase one of Solomon. You can clearly see how in his life, a heavenly treasure, wisdom, was resulting in 30, 60, 100 full in real, tangible, in this age results. Can we all see that? Phase two, Solomon, for whatever reason, in his older age, begins to marry the daughter of kings, the daughters of kings, these princesses who are not Jewish, they're not religious, or they have their own religions. He begins to marry them and creates this huge entourage. And he does it for alliances. He does it because he wants to become stronger. He does it because he wants to save Israel, I suppose. But all of a sudden, all of these new foreign gods, these pagan gods, begin to invade the kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Israel. And to make it even worse, Solomon builds altars to these gods and goddesses. And he employs priests and all of these things. And so Solomon in his old age, actually you'll see in Deuteronomy chapter 17, there's these commands for what kings are supposed to not do, lest they become like Pharaoh. And here we see that Solomon breaks every single edict. He becomes just like Pharaoh. And here's what God says to Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 9, he says, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he'd forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear down the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. And that's exactly what happens. Solomon loses it all, the kingdom, the money, everything. He loses it all. Why? Because he lost the heavenly treasure. He lost the wisdom. Today, we call this in leadership the Solomon Paradox. You probably know somebody that does this. Incredibly wise people who give incredibly good advice that they never follow themselves. This is the Solomon Paradox. You give great advice that you don't take for yourself. Here's a good exercise you can give. Next time you're in a big challenge, write an email to yourself. Dear Bobby, I had this exchange today. I'm not sure what to do. What should I do? Read it then and then write an email response. You will give yourself 
really good advice and you'll be tempted not to follow him. You'll be tempted not to follow him. Do not fall trap for the, to the Solomon paradox because the Solomon paradox is the way that you have heavenly treasures but you refuse to access them. Here's the final analysis for Solomon. He had an incredibly huge heavenly portfolio, but he lost his ATM card. He had, he, he had billions of dollars, but he lost his checkbook. It was all there, but he gave up access. Don't do that. Keep saving, keep storing, keep building your heavenly portfolio, but whatever you do, don't forget that all the money, all the goodwill, all the blessing in your life, it comes from the Lord. If you turn your back on the Lord, you turn your back on everything that gives life in this world. So let's talk about your heavenly portfolio. Let's talk about your treasures. Let's see what you actually got in the account. Should we take a look? Let's see what we got. Here's how you can improve your heavenly portfolio. First, let's just make one thing clear. Let's start at zero. So many people today in investing, in you know, normal investing, we would say, are in debt. Student loan debts, $100,000, $20,000 car debt, big mortgage. What if I told you God has a debt forgiveness plan for you? Many of us, we have heavenly debts. We have the sins, the, the bad will, the bad faith, the way that we've lied and tricked people, the way we've treated our children or our grandchildren, the way we've treated our spouse or, or old people we've dated or our old roommate or old business partners. We've, we've done things in the past that we regret. We've made mistakes. But God can delete those tapes. God can destroy those files. He did it on the cross of Christ. So let's start at zero first of all, by understanding that death and sickness and sin, it all died on the cross, and we're gonna start at zero. You can have your slate clean, amen? That's the gospel, that's good news. All right, now that we started there, I wanna talk about, I'm gonna pull this from Proverbs chapter three, what I call the golden trinity. If you're a note taker, this is the time to do it. I think this is the most important sermon I'm gonna preach all year. I think anybody who does what I tell them to do today, their life will never be the same. And I think it's in these three heavenly treasures, that understanding that if you store up these three things, your life will never be the same. Your finances will never be the same. Your physical health will never be the same. Your family will never be the same. Your walk with God will never be the same. Waking up in the morning will never be the same. If you understand this golden triangle, if you understand these three greatest of heavenly treasures that are given to us from the Word of God. Here's the first great heavenly treasure. Number one, favor with God and man. This is a treasure that creates opportunity and second chances. We all need it. Favor with God and man. You can have this with the Lord and you can have this with people. It's the opportunity and it's the second chances treasure that you can store in heaven. Some characters that for sure had this, David had this, Joseph had this, Abraham had this. How do you get goodwill? How do you get favor with God and man? The Bible tells us, there's two things. It says this, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart and you will have favor with God and man. That's how you get it. You hear what it was? I said at the beginning, love and faithfulness. Jesus says himself, love one another and ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. There it is. Love and faithfulness. Here's what love is. Love means real impact to the benefit of others. Here's what love means. It means real service. Here's what love means. It means generosity. If you don't have any generosity, you probably don't have much love. It's an area of growth for you. The Bible tells us if you don't give away 10% of your money, you're robbing God and you won't have any bless financial blessing in your life. So give away 10% of your money, whether it's to your church or to your neighbor or to people in need or to your favorite charity. You need to become a generous person. And it's hard to do when you haven't had a lot, but the irony is that unless you open your hand to give, you also won't open your hand to receive. So this is what the Bible teaches. That's love, so loving other people, um, at least with 10% of your money and with your service and with your time, and also faithfulness. Faithfulness means people can count on you. It means you do it over a long period of time. A man says, I tried faithfulness, right? Here's what we know. Faithfulness is not something you try. It's someone you are. 
It's someone people can count on. It's something that you always are. Faithfulness is not something you tried once. It's something you are day after day, month after month, year after year. If you're faithful and if you love people, you will increase in this heavenly treasure of favor with God and with man. Number two, number two, treasure in the golden triangle, wisdom. We've already talked about it. Wisdom is a treasure of joy, success, and a good life. Today we've confused wisdom with uh, knowledge. Knowledge is also super important. Here's something we can say about science. Science, which is so important. I love science. I love the sciences. Science can give us knowledge, but it cannot give us wisdom. Science cannot give us wisdom. That's why the smartest people in the world who have tons and tons of knowledge very often still have messed up lives. Their bank accounts are empty. They're, they've been married multiple times and just can't be happy in a relationship. They always go back to the same toxic people or whatever. They use drugs and alcohol. They're never happy because science, and which is important, knowledge and wisdom get confused. So here's what uh, learning in science looks like. And it's important, Learn, you know, scientific understanding is important, but this is what it looks like. Understanding observations, measurements, facts, or principles. But here's what learning and wisdom looks like. Very simple, a change in behavior. If your behavior hasn't changed, you haven't grown in wisdom. So learning and wisdom is a change in behavior. Do you keep going back to the same rotten guy? You haven't grown in wisdom. Do you keep gambling? Do you keep getting fired for the same reason? The list goes on and on. When these things happen, it's a temptation to blame others, to blame something genetically, to say, I'll never get over it, to say this, to say that. At the end of the day, you lack wisdom. And here's how you get wisdom. It's the only way you get it. You get it through trial and error, or you get it from the mistakes of others. In other words, the only way to get wisdom is either you make a mistake or you watch somebody else make a mistake and you don't do it too. That's it. So, wisdom. All right, number three, you ready for it? So we got favor with God and man, we've got wisdom. The last one is faith. Faith is a treasure of miracles and victory against all odds. There's only one way to get faith. I'm just gonna say it plainly. There's only one way to get faith. You don't get faith by thinking harder. You don't get faith by trying harder. You don't, there's only one way to get faith and that's the Bible. That is it. The only way to increase your faith is to hear the word of God. To hear it, to believe it. It's bread. The Bible is bread. And it's not bread every once in a while, it's your daily bread. People say today, wow, Hannah has so much faith. Hannah lays hands on people and they get well. Hannah speaks and I believe it and I feel like my spirit changes. Here's what Hannah does. Hannah reads the Bible, not every month, not every Sunday, every day. And it's annoying. That's, it is. Every night. If you ask Hannah, why do you have so much faith? She will either say, I don't have that much faith, or she'll say, uh, it's the Bible, right? Oh yeah, I, I for sure have faith, I know I do. Yeah, she does have faith, she knows she has faith, and she knows it come, came from the Bible. Okay, if you want faith, if you want miracles in your life, you wanna overcome things against all odds, you have to eat your bread every day. Just every day, and it doesn't have to be that much, like a couple minutes every day, five minutes, it's not that much. Listen to it maybe in your car if you don't make time for it. If you build any of these three things, especially all of these three things, your life will never be the same. It's a guarantee and you'll have access your whole life to this incredible treasure that brings the, everything that you actually need and want from life. So Father, we ask you in Jesus' name for all the treasures of heaven that you make available through your Holy Spirit, through the resurrection of Jesus, and through your word. And we pray that every day we would grow in these things, that every day we would not compare ourselves to anyone else but who we were yesterday. Help us to understand, Lord, that to invest in ourselves is a gift to others. It's a gift to you. It's a gift to the people that love us. And so we decide today to do it in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for watching our power and your support to us. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 to 10, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdoms and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Today, the message of Pastor Bob Bichilla is to grow and improve in God. Pastor Bob Bichilla teaches us to achieve God's calling in our life is by working hard on our spiritual life and storing up heavenly treasures where moth and vermin do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdoms and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. In order to grow and improve, we need love and faithfulness, God's wisdom and faith in God. Let's work hard daily to read the Bible so that we can grow spiritually. Our improvement in life can bless the life of other people. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdoms and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Our Power This Motivational TV program is broadcast weekly on TVB Pearl Channel. Every Saturday at 10 a.m. in the morning and every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And you can also watch online simultaneously on My TV Super or www.ourofpower.org.hk. Thanks for joining. God loves you and see you next week on TVB Pearl. Join us again next week as Pastor Bobby Schuler brings you a message of hope on the Hour of Power. And Pastor Bobby would love to hear from you. Just write us. 
Until next week, remember to let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future.